What wrong with these folks? Damn, these folks on good dope. Oh, they on that good shit. The video has been shared hundreds of thousands of times. It happened in the medical district yesterday afternoon. Police say the two snorted heroin inside the bathroom at a nearby Walgreens. I could have died on the side of that road very easily. Two white males and a female down, injured. Man, that folk ain't moved. The heroin takes you to a stage of nirvana. It's that type of deal, nothing matters, no, absolutely nothing. My name is Carla and I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. Hi Carla. Hi Carla. 40 year opiate addiction. And the last eight was straight heroin. And I didn't, want, I didn't want to die. I wasn't ready to die. I've, I always felt like there was something better. And, and there was. I'm Ronald Philip Hires from Memphis, Tennessee. I was born in 1955 and I'm 61 years of age. I was addicted to heroin from 1972 to October of 2016. I have a picture of me in diapers and there's no way that that little baby in diapers thought that 60 years later they would be overdosed in the middle of a city on a bus bench. And that's what drugs and alcohol do to you. They'll take you places you, you can't imagine. When I got to high school, at 13 years old, I ran into a, a lifelong friend of mine. He's dead now. He died in my closet from an overdose. We began sniffing paint at 13 and, and smoking pot and drinking Boone's Farm wine. In the 11th grade, I got myself kicked out of school. My circle of influence was compromised, to say the least. I met Ronnie at a party at his mother and dad's house when I was 16. So I had met him early on, but, but we didn't get together till in my 30s. Things were never normal. We were always going to jail for something. It would either be him or me, and we were always strung out. She was tough enough to, to go to the dope tracks and, and take chances on getting shot and get shot at. You know, that was my kind of girl right then. That was my kind of girl, you know. And we committed a lot of crime together. That's how my life was to me, it was one big party because I didn't want to deal with any feelings. Every situation I was in, four kids I had, I walked away from. Who does that shit? A, a bad person. Where are they? You don't know? It's awkward for me to say dad at times. It's more comfortable for me to say Ron. Right. Yeah, okay. so that was really my first I don't have like really any memory of him like being, you know, what someone would think of as a father. For a long time, he, we didn't see him. I mean, he was in jail sometimes and then he would just pop in and we'd see him just very infrequently. He was drunk or high a lot. He, you know, would hide needles, not like, you know, unused needles. He would hide them in like my drawer in my room. When you get those collect calls from jail, like, you know, I'm talking to him and he's telling me like how hungry he is or whatever. And you feel, I felt bad for him and I was sad and I was, I was scared for him. Like I thought he was like hungry or colder or like somebody was gonna beat him up, you know? And so I would, I would go to bed and I would, I'm sorry. I worried about him a lot. And back then, like, I did want him to get better. <laughs> you just make yourself callous. Like, you get to where it hurts too bad to keep worrying about his livelihood or his, his self, his being. Because nothing you do can help him. 
Like, I couldn't do anything, you know? Like, he was always gonna choose drugs over health, over family, over friendships, over, he was gonna choose drugs no matter what. I was diagnosed with third stage stroke cancer. And I think, late February, early March of 2016. I was at a sad place, I was at a dark place. I was at a, a depressive place more than any other point in my life. 48 years of addiction, 48 years of, 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 of going to jail, 48 years of going to prison, 48 years of watching people die, 48 years of watching people be killed, 48 years of watching them be robbed, 48 years of living life and addiction prompted me to start suicide, start attempting suicide. I had written uh, a, a handwritten obituary and, it, and put it in my wallet. And on the back of it, it's Ronald Philip Hires passed away on, and it, of course the date's blank because we never know when we get put out the game, you know. I'd gotten to that point in my life. And, uh, you know, when you get to that point, you're certainly not happy. The video has been shared hundreds of thousands of times. It happened in the medical district yesterday afternoon. Police say the two snorted heroin inside the bathroom at a nearby Walgreens. Millions saw overdosing on heroin with his wife on a sidewalk in the medical district. The dope boy that uh, we, we were copied from lives in close proximity. So, and Carl is one of those Let's hurry up and do it, you know, and I'm one of those, no, honey, we need to go home and do it. <laughs> nah, let's do it now. So, you know, her, uh, and she always wins out. Yeah. I remember coming up out of it, and it was like <laughs> noise, and it's like you just come up out of some water, like you're, I guess you're drowning. I heard somebody ask me that was behind me, do you know what happened to you? And he said, you overdose on heroin. And I'm like, heroin? Heroin? You know, I couldn't think. I couldn't think what had happened. I went uh, to jail that, that, that evening. And I was there for 30 days. Oh, shit. What? Hey, look. <laughs> I didn't know that was on TV. I didn't know it was in the newspaper. I was shocked, you know. I didn't want to look at it. It was humiliating. When I seen Carla, that's, that's when my heart poured out, you know, because you know, I signed on to be there for her, and hell, I couldn't be there for me, and she was in a bad way. Two white males and a female down, injured. Man, that folk ain't moved. <laughs> You know, especially when she tried to get up a couple of times. That really, that really hurt. <laughs> you know, because it was in public. You know, she was being publicly humiliated. I saw the video on my birthday, and it was right before we were supposed to go out for my birthday dinner. And I remember making fun of him. I was like, there's Ron's 15 minutes of fame. You know, I was like, oh, great. Here we go. And then I started to think, I have to help him. And the only thing I can attribute that to is just God put it on my heart that I had to do something. I called the number on the, at the back of the news story. And if you or your loved one is struggling from addiction, go to our website at WREG.com and click on this story. We put a 20 I didn't even really think about it. I just picked up the phone and called. And I was crying. And I said, the man who OD'd in Memphis, that's my dad. And they said, well, you know, if you can get in touch with him, then we, we want to give him a scholarship to get treatment. I got a, 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 an email, started out with an email. The email just kind of stated that there had been a video and that, um, <clears throat> that we wanted to help this person. Ron was, um, he, he was in a very, very, very bad shape. I didn't know if he would make it. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know. We just took him straight to his bed and, and um, got him in and um, just to get him in the facility, get him safe.
I woke up in a bed on the second floor of this facility. I had enough common sense to let me know where and what this place was about. Easy does it, you know, one day at a time type shit, you know. So I, st I started to leave. I began to look for the, the way out, and I found an elevator, and the elevator opened up on the bottom floor in there, and I, I realized it was co-ed. And that's what I stayed for, you know, because I do like women pretty good. Somebody that works in the jail was trying to help me find some place to go when I got out because Ronnie was in a rehab somewhere. I, and then when I found out, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get in touch with him. You couldn't talk to him anyway. I gave her the number, the number I called, and I said, call them and tell them who you are. They'll, they'll help you. They helped him. And so she, she did. And it was like not even, I think, two days she was on a plane and they had offered her the same um, opportunity. Everything happened very quickly, very fast. And I can remember sitting in the airport thinking, you know, I was by myself now, by myself. And I'm thinking, well, it's gotta be better than where you were. There was someone there to pick me up and then they brought me to Swift River. 1,200 miles away from anything I've ever known. That, that, that was hard. I had to relearn my thinking. I had to relearn my dealing with people, to listen to people. And I had to relearn not to be in a hurry all the time. And, you know, I found out a lot of things. I, I could still learn, and that was a gift that I could still learn. Somewhere along around day 26, I sobered up and, and I asked myself two questions, it is all I did. I asked myself, are you honestly happy? Well, I couldn't answer that with a yes because I had a, an obituary in my freaking wallet. A person trying to actively kill themselves is certainly not happy. Having answered that, I asked myself the next question. Do you want to continue to kill yourself? And I honestly didn't. Six months into my recovery, I texted my daughter that I'm, I am crying tears of deep sorrow for having just now realized what a joy it would have been to have raised you and known you your entire life. It's 2.30 in the morning, I didn't expect an answer back, and I told him that he didn't miss much because I was so awkward until I was like 30. <laughs> I was like, he didn't miss much. I was trying to like lighten, you know, I was trying to make him feel better. Trying to lighten my burden. What a grounded young lady. And I didn't know this about her, you know, but I know it now. So I know how special she is, you know. And that's, uh, that's part of sobriety. You get to see things that you thought you'd never see, you know. And, you know, listening to that and knowing who she is and knowing she's so perfect, uh, it makes me feel way better than any lick of heroin I ever did, uh, any robbery I ever managed to pull off and get away with. It was just one of the most special things I've ever heard in my life, you know, and I'd have never heard it if I hadn't sobered up. Just leave me in this corner. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Ron. I'm an addict and alcoholic. Uh, it's just by the grace of God that I'm here today to even talk to y'all, and, and I mean that. I, mean, I, I can't stress that enough, how, how much I mean that. Like he found some purpose. Like he wants to help other people who are um, stuck in addiction. He wants to bring people to like sobriety and a sober living. And it, I think that's great that he has this passion now. And I think that that's what's really keeping him um, from relapsing. In the sweet name of Jesus, by the blood of Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. I am part of his support system, but I have boundaries, 
And I feel like I have to maintain those boundaries for my, for myself. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you. Hey, man. Thank you much. Yeah. Thank you. Ronnie was my drug partner for for 21 years. And he lives in Mississippi, and I have no desire to live in Mississippi. It's where he lives is just a stone throw from Memphis. I don't know. I just feel like I would be regressing instead of progressing. And I don't want to incorporate myself into his life because this is my life. And I'm happy with my life making my own choices, and I don't want anyone making them for me. I don't put any expectations on the future of Carla and I. I just know that I want her to be happy, and I want me to be happy. Now we talk every day, you know, or at least text, you know, because we got, we got some new stuff to tell each other, you know. She loves telling me about she got her a bed and she got her some teeth. She's getting some LASIK surgery and she, she finally got them last few teeth pulled and got her some dentures and all these things are blessings, you know. We went from two trash bags of clothes in the boarding house to, you know, I've got some things and she's got some things, but the best things that we have is peace. I've come so far that I really don't give a lot to the, to the future. I'm okay where I'm at today. If you could talk to your 19-year-old self now. 19-year-old self. Knowing what I know now. It made me do is think about I, uh, what I didn't do. Well, that kind of got me. <clears throat> I'd have to tell him that uh, life shouldn't be taken lightly. It's a gracious gift. Meant to be enjoyed and not squandered.